Well, thank you for having me. You know, it's, it's kind of a, once I started digging into things, I found out some things that I didn't know. <laughs> and so, um, that was kind of fun. I'll just give a little bio sketch of, of my dad and his history, a little bit of what made him work, because he was the driving force in that business. He was born in Warsaw. His mom died when he was five. And uh, at age 12, his father remarried. And maybe some of you can, in those days, she had a family, so he dumped his family. <laughs> so my dad was on the streets at age 12. His sisters were older. They went to Chicago. One of them was married in Chicago, so the, the girls went to Chicago. But he was just kind of on his own at 12 years old in, in uh, Warsaw, Indiana. And, uh, but that kind of drove him because he, what motivated him was he was never going to have his children suffer what he did. And so, in some sense, he really dedicated himself to provide. That was his goal, to provide for his kids and his family. He wanted to make sure they provided. And so when things got tough, he just kept working harder. And hard work was his, the essence of he worked and worked and worked. And the business was everything. You know, his wife was important, but I think the business was actually probably more important. Than, <laughs> at least in the early years. You know, but uh, that maybe changed as he got a little older and so forth. But uh, he was driven in that sense, and that's what helped make him set. But that's just a little bio sketch of who he was a little bit, kind of what drove him, uh, motivated him a little bit. But it was in 19, he was an armor meat salesman at that time in 1943. And his story that he told me, and how accurate some of the stories he tells me, I would, you know, it's hard to know. But he said, he went to armor meats and said, he wanted a job. I said, we don't need anybody. He said, I'll work for free until I prove myself that I'm a good worker and then you can start paying me. I'll work for free until you think that I'm worth paying. And that was the story that he told. He worked for Armor Meat Company, and so that's how he got associated with grocery stores. He'd call on stores, he was an Armor Meat salesman. So he'd call on Warsaw, he'd call on these areas, and that's how he got affiliated with the grocery business. And it was in March of 1944, which he bought a little store here. It was called Home Cash Grocery here in Bremen. And it was owned by Lester Kuntz. Um, and so he purchased that in March of 1944. And at that time, in, in the area, there was, well, there was a Kroger's here. There was, uh, Kenny's had a supermarket for at least for a while then, before he went to war, and then he closed up during the war. Uh, the South Side Grocery, which was owned by, I think, the Zenses at that time. Um, and also there were some reports that there was, I didn't see anything, but there was reports that there was also an A&P in this, at this town at that time. Uh, so there's quite a few, you know, it's hard to imagine four or five grocery stores in a town that had to be not very, a lot smaller than what it is today. Uh, but also the stores were pretty small. Since this store was just pretty much next door right over here, kind of where the cozy, that little cozy home shop was, that was where the store was. So that was in 1944, and so my oldest sister was two years old at that time when they came over here, and she said they used to set her on the bread racks while they'd work in the store, and she'd sleep on the shelves. <laughs> she didn't remember that, that's what she was told. And, uh, so then it was in 19, or technically 1950, he bought Walter's Meat Market, which was next door to the store, which was, yeah, just right off... Uh, the next building over was Walter's Meat Market. He bought that in 1950. Now here's something I did not know. That my dad sold the store in 1951. So our 70 years may be a little off from Woody's Grocery because we have a, a little three-year gap that, <laughs> that, there, uh, that we didn't own it anyway. It was, it was still called Woody's Grocery for at least a year. But it was sold to a guy by the name of Clarence Sturgis out of Chicago who was a managed jewel tea grocery store in Chicago and he came out and bought his own, bought this store and that was around 1951. And my dad had Walter's Meat Market so that's all he did then. He was in, he kept the name Walter's Meat Market and so, and the other store remained Woody's at least, yeah, as I said, at least a year, maybe even two years. But I know there was a non-compete clause and I got that information from Don Snyder who worked in the store <laughs> at that time. <laughs> and uh, he said uh, that, well, he thought it was a five-year clause. Well, it was, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't by it, but about three years later, in 1955, is when he went out here to, uh, at that time it was St. Joseph Street, 331, and uh, put up a building. Uh, 
you know, huge building at that time, he thought, probably. It was maybe three or 4,000 square feet or something like that. Now, I, I, the one, I don't have any pictures of the store in its original, in the 1955. I don't have anything on that. Um, yet to find, I found some when it was remodeled in 1960. In fact, I think my dad had some postcards made. My sister, one sister still has a postcard that has that store on it from 1960 when it was remodeled. And I do have a couple, yeah, here's a cup. Copy. Here's just a couple old pictures I dug out of magazines of what that store looked like in uh, that would have been the remodel in what was it? The remodel in 1960. After it was remodeled in 1960, there's another. They're kind of not real great pictures, but it gives you an idea. And that was when it still faced 331. And in 1964, the store was incorporated. You know, at that time it was a, before that it was always a kind of a sole proprietorship and and then it became a corporation. And, uh, and there was two other kind of major owners in the store at that time. Now, does anyone know who those would be? John? Do you remember who that would be? Who else? Why would that be stolen? Well, no, Dudley wasn't. That was in the bearing. <laughs> that, was in, that was in the bearing. That was, also, that happened in 1960 also when they first got involved with Universal Bearings. That was Dudley Stover and yeah. Kelly and... Pat, Pat, Pat was one of them, Bob Brothers. And Bob Brothers, oh, right? Bob Brothers. I remember Bob had put the, you know, loaned some money when they were building the store, but at that time, so my dad owned 60%, and they owned, each of them owned 20% of the, of the business at that time. And kind of a philosophy that my dad always kept was that uh, it was good to have some employees that had ownership in the business because they, you look at it differently when, you know, you own part of it, and you know that you're going to get something out of that ownership. And that's, all, that's a plus we, we still have today. You know, I still have, I have three people that own shares in the, in the store that are working there today. So, and then later on I took on another guy by the name of, I didn't know him by Richard Buell, but his, so I was knew him by Red. He worked in the meat department, he was Red Buell, and that was when they still had the slaughterhouse at that time, and the meat department was really huge at that time. For, I mean, we had people, they came from, three or four different states every year to buy a side of beef. Because we had the slaughterhouse and and uh, and we had the service meat case and, and probably, I don't know if it would be a mistake that my dad made, but certainly it hurt the meat business when he went to a self-serve meat case. You know, where they pre-wrapped everything and started putting it out. Um, it, did, it did hurt that meat sales, but uh, the labor intensiveness of the service meat case is it was tough. I mean, it just, it, it was a difficult thing. And then, well, with the slaughterhouse, you know, as modern world was beginning to come in and the government was beginning to get more involved in what we did and how we did things, uh, they didn't like how things were being done at the old slaughterhouse. And, and uh, so to fix that up, I remember the number was like $100,000, you know, it was supposed to be. To, and uh, a lot of money today, but even a lot more money back in the 1960s. Uh, and so they kind of discontinued that. He got out of that slaughterhouse business. And so it, uh, so it ran along until 1977 uh, is when I came along as far as I was in college. And actually, I was uh, in Bible college this time studying for the ministry. <coughs> and I was talking to Donnie Snyder, and he always thought that my dad forced me out of the ministry and forced me into this <laughs> business. That's not true. You know, that's not true. Uh, he never liked me going to the ministry, I know that. <laughs> that wasn't really uh, something that was a, long, a, a great ambition he thought he saw. I wouldn't say, I won't share what he saw his ministry. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, but it was there that I thought, you know, I probably ought to look into going back into the family business. And I thought that's, I, actually, I thought that was something God wanted me to do. And so I called, and, and uh, so at that time, it was in 77, then when I got back into the business, and I worked over at the store in Warsaw, but that was found at some place uh, in the 60s, probably, when they put that in over there for my sister and her husband, kind of ran that store for quite a few years. Um, but, but anyway, so I worked over there a while, and kind of as a training, you know, to, and then I came over here. But I took some ownership in 1977. Actually, I had the whole deal. Or I mean, you know, the, whatever shares my dad had were uh, sold to me, and and uh, 
So I took over ownership at that time. He, he still owned the real estate, the building, so he kind of had me uh, in his crosshairs when he <laughs> still control me. <laughs> but uh, but it was that you know, and then when we when we, we did the first remodel in 1967, when they switched it around, that was when we moved the two houses. And the house I lived in, which was right on North Street, and the house next door to us, which was Roy and Ivandell Muffley. They lived there, and those houses were then moved in 1967, and they're still on Maple Street today. On the corner is Muffley's house, and the next one over is, uh, is where I grew up, at least until sixth grade. And one, one thing that uh, people don't know, you know, my dad put everything back into the business. You know, we didn't, there wasn't any frills around our house. You know, our carpeting had holes in it. And, and my mom was embarrassed to have people over, you know, she had these throw rugs covering stuff up, but nothing went back into the, the house. Everything went back into the business. We had cash, it went to the business, either went to the bearing or went to the grocery store and uh, didn't go to any, there were any other frills. But so how they got the house out here in 331, my mom inherited money. She inherited money from her aunt, and I think it was like $30,000. And so she said, I'm going to build a house. <laughs> and so that's how they built the house out there at 331. The house my dad enjoyed and really loved the pond and really became a great place for it. But it was our mom that pushed that thing to go with, with basically her money and not his money. But, uh, but anyway, so those two houses were moved then. Um, and then it was in 1990. It was probably, we began to get squeezed at the store. We began to try to figure out, I guess late in the 1980s, what we were going to do. Um, we had structural, some structural issues, and, and the health department was all over us because of our old building. And I, I did get drugged down to the off down there one time in the county, and he was going through, because our, our physical structure wasn't what was up to snuff. Well, what the health department guy never told me is he harassed me for a couple years was that we were grandfathered in according to the law. And so when I went down to the office, I took Mark Wagner, my attorney, I said, Mark, let's go down there. And he said, well, here it says it's, he's grandfathered in. <laughs> and so that kind of set that. But we decided we still needed to begin to move to uh, modernize. modernize and, uh, and so it was in yeah, September of uh, 19, no, December of 1990 is when we opened this current location. And those who were around remember that was quite a project. We also moved two houses then, and that was Mrs. Klein's house and what used to be what's called the old Burke's house, but my parents owned it, the other house on the corner. Uh, they were, it was a rental property for them. So we moved those two houses, and uh, one of them is also on Maple, but it's further down in Maple. Mrs. Klein's house is still up and going. It's just off of Collier and Maple Street there. There's a little brick house that sits there. And the other one was moved on down towards where the slaughterhouse used to be. And down that lane, there was a house sitting there. But uh, Greg, my brother-in-law, Greg Mixler, had those houses. But Greg, uh, one of his renters wasn't too good in that one house. Apparently, they were meth, meth people. So that house has now been torn down and, and destroyed. But anyway, uh, so that was when uh, we built the new store. Then it was in 1990. Uh, my dad saw the plans, he saw the pictures that we were going to do, the architectural drawings, but he died in 1989. And so he never really got to be, the, the business probably wasn't nearly as important to him as it once was. You know, the, absolutely there were things involved in his life then that were more significant to him than, uh, than that business. But uh, he did get to see the drawings and he was excited about that. But that was a big project because it kept the old store open and we cut off 30 feet of the old store. You know, we just sawed it off. <laughs> you know, where all the registers and everything were, we, we sawed that section off and moved the store 30 feet. And where the, those houses were, we used that as parking. We began to build a new store in the existing parking lot. And, uh, and it was a long process. You know, we had that contest, you know, guess the date. Piper was building. <laughs> sometimes John, John's dates sometimes aren't. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, we can get it done. Yeah, we can get it done. Well... And he does. He does do it, and he does do it, and he does it right. But sometimes his timing is not maybe what we'd like. But, uh, but 
But his billing is also pretty easy. That's another story. <laughs> but so that was in 1990 then when we, uh, December of 1990, we opened up that new store. And it was kind of a rocky road that first year. I mean, we, I really questioned whether, you know, our P&L statement that first year was bad. It was bad. And I went, boy, oh boy. Uh, this is the best. This is, we're better off in the old place, I can tell you that. But, uh, but anyway, it's, it, it got a little better, and it's, uh, we continually progressed and, and certainly made some advancements and improvements. We purchased them. You know, the, the modern, the earlier history, I'm having trouble with my dates, but when we purchased the Marathon Station, we opened the Marathon Station, was still there. And we existed that way for at least five years, maybe six or seven years. So it was in the late 1990s that we ended up purchasing the, the Marathon Station there. And, uh, and it was open for a while. I think Tony rented it there from me for, you know, for a few years until we finally he decided to move out and we decided to tear it down and, and clean it up and but it was left um, just in dirt for a, you know at least a couple of years before we really decided to do anything with it and the, you know the problem with doing those things <coughs> is that uh, you know if we left it dirt there wasn't any problem but if we paved it then we had to put in all the drainage for the water and everything um, for the city the drain we had to connect to the city we had to spend I said you know if we improve it we get kind of penalized, but if we leave it like this, we're, we're save money. That's, that was kind of the bottom line. But anyway, I'm just, uh, how government works, and <laughs> I've got a little political spiel on the side. <laughs> but, uh, but then we did have that paved and, uh, and redone, and, and Piper also did that, and I'm not sure when that was done, but I have yet to pay for that. I have yet to get a bill on that. <laughs> That's correct. I talked to John just this, uh, I said, John, if I die, <laughs> you know, uh, you need to get me billed and we need to begin to work on this, because I know the price is too high, or he wouldn't have waited this long. <laughs> and I said, when I put in my will, I'm just going to say, you're going to make X amount, and that's it. <laughs> but anyway, that's just a little um, So that's kind of where we are today. So our 70-year anniversary, yeah, we got that little gap in there that we may have to redo a 70-year anniversary in three years or something. I don't know. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's kind of our history. Is there any questions? And, um, and when we did open, here was an article that was in. We made National Magazine at that time in supermarket business, a National Grocer Magazine. We became, uh, let's see what it says, the nicest little supermarket in northern Indiana. So there was that article that was... And that was kind of the architect who submits those things. They all like to get, they like to get the publicity. It wasn't really something that we did, but uh, people who designed the store and so forth put that in. So we were at a, written up a national magazine at that time. So any questions or comments, complaints? Complaint? How, how many employees do you have? Uh, we currently have around 50, you know, but uh, mostly it's part-time. Mm -hmm. We probably have close to 20 full-time and about 30 part-time. <coughs> My son worked there for, went, went to Purdue, went to the British, and yeah. he'd go clean up the butcher shop. I don't like he worked at the Yeah, he worked in the meat department, and uh, yeah, he knew those guys, Red and, uh, and, and Bob. I think he worked when Bob Crothers was there, and John is still there. I want you there to call me and we take a truck to go down North Bend and get a whole load of potatoes. Oh, yeah. I didn't know we'd go home. They were poor truck. And I just go right along with your dad between one summer and I'd get a bunch of potatoes. Yeah, we used that truck quite a bit. And uh, I, I can remember going in that similar truck. We'd drive to Chicago to get produce on Saturday nights. Which was uh, before the massive delivery systems that we had. We, you'd have to go get the stuff, and my dad was a worker. He was going to get it. And he was going to try to find the best that he could find, and he really worked hard at that. And so we'd drive to Chicago, you know, every Saturday night, and I used to sleep in the back of the truck. You know, this old, you know, beat up truck, and we haul produce back. And, and, How long did you have the slaughterhouse? Well, you know, I was never a part of that. You know, my dad had it probably since from. I would imagine when he bought Walter's Meat Market, that was that was there. That was part of Walter's Meat Market. So he probably had that in 50 and at least went up to 
the late 1960s, you know, probably 1967, 68, right in that area, I think. Okay. But, but I can remember when my dad, uh, <clears throat> when Leo Hockey, who was kind of the, the butcher out there, it took a special guy to, to, to do that stuff out there. Right. And, he, and uh, but one time he got sick or broke his arm or something, and my dad, but I can remember my dad working at the store all day, going there and working until 11 o'clock at night, sleeping until 3 in the morning, getting up at 3 in the morning and going out to butcher cattle. Wow. And he did that for, you know, weeks on end. You know, I, I used to figure, you know, I was just, uh, I don't know, I'm probably in junior high, but I figured he was working like 120 hours a week. Mm -hmm. But he never complained. Mm -hmm. You know, I never heard my dad complain about work. Never. Now, <laughs> I can't say that about me. <laughs> my wife can't say that about me. <laughs> but he never complained. In fact, he, he, you know, he, can't say, he told me, he said, there was never a day I got up that I didn't want to go to work. Never a day I got up didn't want to go to work. Mm. What was the butcher's name that you used to work out there? Paulson. George Paulson. He worked there. Paulson. Well, there was Bob Crothers who worked in the meat department at the store, and Red Buells was another one. Uh, John Nelson? Yeah, John. Nelson. Yeah, John. Uh, was there for quite a few years. I think Pony worked for, for uh, hockey out there, yeah. and I know some of the Weldies worked out there with with hockey at some point. One of the, a couple of Weldy twins, I think, Urban. But well, which one okay. shot that deer? Oh yeah, that was Leo Hockey. That was hockey. Yeah. He, uh, he got okay. Eight. Yeah, that was uh, that was a big stink. <laughs> I do remember that. So there was this deer hanging around out back of the slaughterhouse, and so hockey was there and. <laughs> And uh, he saw that thing out there, so he thought, well, I'll just drop that thing. I'll drag it in here, and we'll, we'll have some deer meat. And so he shot this deer, but unfortunately, one of the neighbors up on the hill was watching this deer and thought how nice it was. <laughs> and and called, the, called the conservation officers up. It wasn't deer season at that time, so, so it was a problem. We had one, we had a slaughtered deer hanging up in uh, where you're not supposed to have, you know. <laughs> Deer meat, and uh, it plus was out of season, so it was, it was a big fine over that deal. I remember that. Yes, that, that is a, a, a true story. <laughs> I know. You might remember my sister-in-law Donna Garrison. Oh yeah. She worked for Dad in that little store here. Uh huh. One time, word said Donna go back there and get some wrapping paper. You should call a phone with your toilet paper. <laughs> I thought you said crappy paper. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's a true story. <laughs> well, I believe that. I know Donna or Donna and my dad had a pretty special relationship. I know that you know, over the years. Too. Crappy paper. Crappy paper. That's a true story. <laughs> Nelson? Oh, did your dad uh, buy produce from the uh, area uh, farms? Because I know my brother raised cucumbers one year that Woody bought. Oh yeah, he would buy one, yeah, he bought a lot of local. Yeah, and then my mother, I think our mother uh, sold, eggs. sold eggs to yeah, Woody yeah. for years and years. Yeah, we bought a lot of eggs and yeah, from local, yeah, they were always looking for, he was always looking for that, yeah. So especially in the early years, yeah, especially when, the, uh, but I know he always had, he was buying local eggs for a long time. And remember in the old days, you know, now we got eggs that are dated, they're, you know, they're refrigerated, but in the old days, they were just set in the back room. They were never. They never saw a refrigeration until we put them out in the case. So we put them out in the refrigerated case then, and there was no dates or anything on them, and and uh, wasn't too big of a deal. In fact, if you go to Australia, all their eggs in the grocery shelves. They got a whole. They have a whole aisle. It's just eggs, and they're all unrefrigerated and. And they're doing fine, but they they they, yeah, but they. We also wash the eggs over here. They don't wash them over there, so that gives them a little extra protection. Now they washed them, which is less protection, but it's maybe they think it's less bacteria, I guess. Maybe, I don't know. But anyway, that's just uh, how things have changed. And, uh, yeah. I can remember in the 50s when they was doing the construction down there. That was a daily routine for myself and Kirk Bonner to get on our bikes and ride up there and watch what they were doing. The Pipers was doing that. Yeah, Roger. Uh, uh, we was there the one day, and Eddie and Ollie got into an argument about something, and Eddie was running the crane, and he had a beam hanging up there to put it in place, and he got mad, and he left. And he just didn't come back for three or four days, and, and 
Ollie was going to get in and run the crane. Well, Roger wouldn't let him get in there. They, they had a big feud that day. I don't know if they got anything accomplished. But that, was a, that was a daily routine for me and Kirk. Watch what they well, were watch doing. Yeah, watch what they worked on. Yeah, I'm sure that was... Uh, see, Ollie Piper, I didn't really know. I remember him, but uh, he was pretty old, but I can remember. And you have to talk play golf. Yeah, yeah, I started playing golf in his 50s. Golf, his own golf cart. Oh yeah, yeah. He won that golf cart, and uh... I played golf with him, and I think maybe a Lions Club tourney over at Syracuse one time. We was in a foursome together, and where he hit woods, he just everything was iron, you know. At that time, I don't know if he ever did hit any woods. Well, we tried to get him, but yeah, he became the iron man yeah. on the golf course. Yeah. But well, we're up there, and I chip up on the green with a nine iron. What you use there, Brownie? <laughs> nine iron. Oh, that's a good shot, so I'll try that. Gets up there and takes a swing, and the ball is miles in the air when it goes over the ground. He's <laughs> standing there looking, and I said, What'd you do, Woody? I don't know what he's looking at. Bob. I says, That's a nine the way you're looking at it. The way I'm looking at it is a six. <laughs> but he was a lot of fun. You know? well, he enjoyed his golf, and uh, yeah, he wasn't one of the best players in the world, but he did have a whole lot. I do remember that. He was playing with Russell Bolt. It was kind of hard on Russell and my dad, who was a half golfer, who cut that old one. And he didn't see it, you know. He had one of those low screamers sliding around and, and it went in the hole. Uh, yeah. Who was in cooperation with Pat Farr and who was... And Bob Crothers. Bob Crothers. Yeah. And uh, I guess Woody does have some drawbacks because uh, some people came back again after leaving. Marika, oh yeah, Marika yeah. came back and uh, yeah, we've had a lot of them uh, come and go. That went for postal service. Yeah, Darren, <laughs> yeah, Darren, we had Darren and uh, me. Butcher Shelby Mast had left us for a while, <coughs> and Marika was gone for a while, and uh, yeah, they did come back. You deal with Centella. Who is Centella, and okay. how does that work? Okay, Centella. Yeah, okay. We, we do with Centella Grocers, and that's a little. If you look at the original pictures, how are we on time here? Oh, got a clock line. Okay, we're, we're way no ahead of schedule. So, uh, originally the little store where there was an IGA, Independent Grocers Association, and so what the IGA was, was basically, a, it was like a co-op. It was a warehouse that sold to small independent stores, and they'd go there to, to get their stuff, compared to a Kroger's that had their own warehouse, or an A&P that had an A&P warehouse for all their stores. And so it was A&P, or I mean, there was um, IGA for a while. When we moved over there, we uh, were Levy Ward in South Bend. Levy Ward Grocers in South Bend. And um, that was our supplier for probably most of the 60s. And we had a little stint where we were with food marketing, which is now super value. And about 1967 that we went with Centrilla Grocers in Chicago. And uh, Centrilla was probably a uh, more of a, it was a pure co-op compared to the others were just, they were kind of corporations that independent grocers bought from. But Centrilla was a pure co-op, which we were also part owners in the, uh, in the warehouse. And we were with them for 30 years. And things, well, and at that time, you know, big Walmarts would begin to come and roll in and, and the whole landscape of the world was changing as far as in the retail grocery industry. I mean, they reshaped everything. Everything. And uh, they got strong and big enough. They pretty well began to dictate what the companies would do and how they would present deals. And, and uh, they're a very powerful force in, in the industry. And so things began to change and so a lot of independents were going away. There wasn't nearly the independent stores that once were. And so certified was shrinking. And so we switched over to Central Grocers. And certified has since then merged with Central Grocers. And that's basically a co-op. And so we're with, there's probably 700 stores with Central Grocers, and they have sales of about $2 billion. So we have a buying power of $2 billion a year. So the truth is, on, on grocery and stuff, I'll probably buy a little bit better than even Martins will buy. The truth is. Uh, now on individual vendors in anymore, then it gets a little different. You know, with Pepsi and those places, uh, that's where we run into a few more problems. 7-Up, they have mass merchandise pricing, and they have... 
grocery store pricing. So targets, I'll go into Target sometimes, and Seven Up's got a deal, you know, three for ten dollars on twelve pack pops, and I go to Seven Up. We don't have that deal for you. You know, I always say it's a violation of antitrust laws, but as yet I haven't taken the time to sue them. <laughs> but now that my son's an attorney, maybe I can <laughs> get a good deal on an attorney. <laughs> but uh, so uh, we do have a pretty. That's a you know that's the only reason we can survive in this market is to have that kind of a buying co-op and and we got in early enough that we pretty have all full rights in that co-op and anymore if you're a smaller store going in they don't give you quite the deal that we have um, and so we've done pretty well and so all the STRAC and ultra stores up in the east uh, northeast Indiana are all central stores and they're all company owned stores now they also own probably a hundred of their own stores so in some sense we're part owners in these great big stores up there as well. Not very big owners, but <laughs> we can say we are. But, uh, um, Walter's Meat Market and the uh, Slaughterhouse, where were, where, what was the location? Well, Walter's was just right next door to here. It was, right. The store was right. where, uh, uh, we say, Miller North, or the, the Cozy, whatever oh, the Cozy the Shop was. Yeah. And then and where the financial the place here was where Walter's Meat Market was. Now, uh, in the old, old maps, it shows a, a rendering uh, plant behind, and maybe, maybe it was a slaughter. Oh, maybe they had, maybe at one time he had it here. Yeah. We've got old maps back here okay. that, that indicate years and what was there. So mm -hmm. That could be, he could have had that rendering plant before they moved it out. Uh, where was it when it was moved out? Okay, well, the, well, you'll see where the funeral home is, Michelin Funeral Home, and then the uh, James. James Park and what's yeah. the, the yeah. retirement nursing building? Home. Nursing home, thank you. Yeah. That's the word yeah. I'm looking for. The yeah. nursing home. Yeah. It was there was a little lane that ran all the way back there and it was setting right back there. Yeah. And uh, that's where it was. And we donated a little bit of that land to the town they were gonna do that's where kind of the park or yeah. if you take that James Park all the way back, some of that land was what uh, we had donated yeah. Yeah. Okay. to the town. Uh, that was part of that slaughterhouse property at, at one time. But that's all been torn, you know, I, we tore it down, I'm not sure when, but it got to be, a, once we stopped using it, we used to have a little basketball court out there in the barn, but it got to be a problem with kids going out there smoking and, and all kinds of stuff, and so we ended up just, and we used to use it as a storage facility, we used to, but that was, I just can't believe we ever made any money using that as a storage facility. By the time the mice ate up some of the stuff, and the water leaked in the building, and and it, yeah, and hauling it back there, loading it up in the truck, and wheeling it back, and kids breaking in and steal, especially the toilet paper. Kids would break in and steal the toilet paper. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> but uh, so, but that was abandoned. And now in the in the new store, we have a pretty good sized basement, which is kind of part of our philosophy. We try to buy in on deals so we can continue to have something reduce the price a little bit. For a while, that was what we did with Charmin. You know, we had we'd buy truckloads from Procter and Gamble at that time. We'd buy directly from Procter and Gamble. We'd buy a truckload of Charmin, and we had to find a place to put it. And we always had uh, good prices on that. And uh, but no longer are we able to do that. Uh, we still will buy in those deals, but uh, yeah, that those that deal landscape and how it's, it's changed quite a bit too. Uh, you know, um, again, Walmart's kind of changed that and. Walmart's got, they got a good deal going when they, you know, if they don't sell stuff, they don't pay for it, compared to me. You know, when I buy something, I, I, if I lose it, I get stuck with it. They won't get stuck with anything. They don't get stuck with anything. Is, is Donna your longest employee? No, probably Ed Beery is. Um, Donna was there, she was, let's see, I carried out groceries when Donna was a cashier. And at that time, she was pregnant. And so she was just there a year or so at that time. And I was probably 14 or 15. And, uh, and then she, once she was, she left, and I think, I don't know when they were in California, when her husband was in the service. But she came back then. But I had been in the store a few years when she came back. But Ed was there when I got there. Uh, he started when he was probably 17 years old. And he's currently 63. He may have left for a week or two weeks one time to do something else, but he's been there the longest, Ed Berry. Will 
there be a Woody's 30 years from now? Good question. You know, that's, that's a good question. You know, uh, at this point, none of my kids have really had too much of an interest. I know my one son would like to see it keep him going. He's more of the, he knew my dad the best, my oldest son, and so he kind of has a sense of family and a sense of history in that, and uh, he would like to, I'm sure, see it keep, kept, keep it going. But, but my dad, he kind of retired out of the store at 55. He was pretty young, when he really kind of got out of it. You know, I, I'm surprised at that. As much as he loved to work and all that, I'm not sure uh, what, you know, what really took place with him. What frustrations would cause him to, to do that, or maybe he just wanted to get out of my way. He knew we couldn't get along together if we worked together too closely. I know that. You know, we would, we'd uh, have troubles. You know, we had a lot of troubles at times. Yes. You know, and you're uh, truth is, yeah. Uh, my dad, you, you're damned if you didn't, you're damned if you did. <laughs> you know, if the store was a mess, and we just because we've been real busy, he'd just jump all over me because we hadn't, you know, you haven't been taking care of stuff. You're not, you know, things, the shelves are all a mess. But if the shelves were in perfect condition, he'd say, you haven't done any business. <laughs> so, that was, uh, Would it be possible to put all the groceries in what you got now and then go to store what you had? Oh, no. <laughs> no, that'd be impossible. I think, let's see, we probably have what they call SKUs or items in the store. We're probably close to 25,000 individual items that are in the store. And, uh, bigger than And so, yeah, in those days, you know, I'm sure there was only, probably just had the staples. You know, you had your flour, your sugar, and maybe a can of beans. <laughs> I don't know. But, I remember you had only about five or six different cereals of maybe. Oh yeah. Now I don't know. You got a whole aisle, a whole aisle of cereals, yeah. There's varieties and sizes and there's always uh, gimmicks to always something new, you know. <clears throat> Most new products fail. You know, I think like it's like seventy or eighty percent of all new products don't last a year. But hmm. that's actually what drives the new growth of the business is, is new products and We went to the store in Warsaw and taking brother-in-law. Yeah, that was my brother-in-law, Ron Hoskins. And Is that still going? No, that, that went out. We were in the new store at that time because I tried to, actually I tried to buy the store at one time. Probably glad I didn't. I don't know if I'd have been more than I could have handled maybe. But because uh, I knew it was, it was beginning to have some issues and and uh, he kind of said, well, I'd get rid of it for this. And I said, well, I'll take it for that. Mm -hmm. Well, once I said I'd take it for that, he decided not to sell it to me. <laughs> but uh, once they had liquidated it, then he calls me and wanted me to come over. And, because, and I was kind of irritated. I said, you need to liquidate all your help's gone, and now you want me to come over? And because I did some, I had spent some money and did some drawings. We were going to do some redoing. And so we were, looked at really going into there. And, and I always kind of liked to do that. But... Uh, <clears throat> That'd be a tough marketplace these days too, but it's good we did. And that probably the closest I ever came to a nervous breakdown when we were building the new store. You know, uh, the amount of decisions that I had to make was just on a daily. Was just, and I reached a point where my brain no longer would shut off. It just stuck on. I couldn't sleep anymore. I just, and so I thought, boy, you know, this is a dangerous place to be. <laughs> And I thought this is this is probably what a nervous breakdown gets to be like. You know, you're, you're, my brain just wouldn't shut off. It just kept going, and uh, until after we got going a little bit, <clears throat> but that was a tough. Nelson um, Myers uh, has this beautiful gardens up there in Grand Rapids, and I wonder if there any plans for bringing <laughs> them. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> oh. Oh, you're fun chasing that fly. I have a fly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think your, your family and the business has done a lot of um, giving to the community, though, in different ways. Yeah, like, you know, the, the, the James Park land, for example, and mm -hmm. scholarships. And, yeah, and one thing my dad did that no one really, he never told anybody for a long time, was the Project Help. Mm -hmm. He gave $25,000 to get Project Help started. Uh, and with Wilbur and... Uh, I think Wilbur Bowser was one of the guys that was Mr. Shorter. Uh, and he never, you know, that's something I really didn't know either until after he died, really. And, and, uh, so there's a lot of things he did. He did a lot of, you know, he, 
He did a lot of good things for a lot of And if somebody wanted to work, I don't care who you were, if you if showed a desire to work, he'd always give somebody a chance. I don't care who you were, he'd always give you a chance. But if you didn't work, you were out the door. I mean, it, it wouldn't be pleasant. You wouldn't, it wouldn't be pleasant if you didn't want to work. Well, Woody was a big contributor to Grace Church, even after he wasn't, um, yeah. you know, he didn't go to church there all the time. But it seemed like whenever they were short, they would come to Woody and he would... Yeah, he, and he actually gave to all the, when, you know, something I don't do, but he gave to all the churches in town at one time. I mean, every year at Christmas, he'd give every church that was in town some kind of a contribution. And, uh, and if he missed one, they'd come, they'd come knocking at his door. <laughs> There's a church he didn't know about, you know, I think it was a little Pentecostal church outside of town or something. And they said, well, we're going to give this money to church, but we didn't get anything. <laughs> but anyway. But hopefully we will be around in 30 years. You know, so, you know. So, because you know, you don't realize how many people when they move to a town, if they don't have a grocery store, it's it's an inconvenience. Yeah, you know, a lot of these towns have lost them. Bourbon's lost their grocery stores. North Liberty's lost their grocery stores. Used to be Wilcox, Dillingham's, and and a lot of small communities have lost their grocery stores because it's just it's difficult because uh, people are just going to the Myers to buy stuff and they're buying groceries and. You know, our business has changed. You know, Christmas used to be our biggest weeks of the year, but they're not anymore because people are out shopping. And the stores they shop at now are also grocery stores. And, uh, and so uh, that hurts us. But, but probably gas, higher gas prices does help us a little bit. I hate to say that, but that's a little bit of truth. And, uh, you don't classify Dollar Generals as grocery stores. Well, they're getting, you know, that's an interesting, that's a very interesting point. They have become that. They, have become, they didn't start out that way. They have become that, especially in the small communities. And the market share, grocery industry, the last two years has lost some market share. And that's who they lost it to, is the Dollar Generals. Or the family dollars and Dollar Generals. And Your little Diet Cokes are a penny cheaper for an eight pack than they are. Oh, okay. <laughs> I keep track of that. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it is a different landscape out there. There's not a whole lot of single store independence left in the world. Very few, actually. And, uh, yeah, and, and I, I have good people working for me. You know, if, if I had to work 100 hours a week at this time in my life, you know, yeah, I'd probably look to get out of it. But I'm not. You know, if I want to play golf in the afternoon, usually I can go play golf in the afternoon. And that was something my dad had always said to me. He said, I don't want you to work as hard as I've worked. I'd like for you to be able to, you know, enjoy some other things when you... And I have. You know, he did, has, he did provide for me. I had it a little easier than what he had. A lot easier, actually. But, uh, and, but certainly the Bering was a big contributor to making my family's life easier. You know, Bering began to make... It didn't make money for a long time, but when it began to make money, that, it was easier than the grocery business, my dad used to say. <laughs> he didn't... He never saw margins like he saw in, in manufacturing, but he saw in, uh, in the grocery industry. It was a big difference. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah. so, so that was, a, at least in the financial side, that was a, a big help and, and provided some financial security for, for him and helped the business in that sense. Do you ever have any people come and want to buy you out? Uh, yes. Big... Well, Martins has approached me. Okay. Um, and there was rumors going around for a long time Martins was going to buy us. You know, I, I, I deal with these rumors a lot. But um, and they had heard that we were for sale, and that's why Martins called me, and, uh, and then a couple other. But uh, just though I had a couple that <clears throat> I came close to selling it once. You know, I had some guys interested. And I, I was ready to get out. That was a long time ago. That was back before we built the new store. Uh, it was probably in the early '80s. I just about sold it once. I thought about getting out of it. And, being done with it. Well, what, the problem we've had, what we had, when we built the new store, we had a lot of papers and everybody coming in, what the information about the store and history, and I had this history file that disappeared, you know. Hmm. I didn't keep very good track of it, I just, you know, just sick that I didn't, so I had some of these pictures that I had, I don't have, and I had a little, you know, a little uh, thermometer or something with the Woody's Grocery, it was kind of something they'd given out at one time. It was Woody's Food Mart, yeah. and it was, uh, well, was put a three-digit or four-digit phone number on there or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, well, thank you. Thank you.